I always feel like they are seeing in part. You know, they will see a part of the day of the Lord. Some people will see uh, those who get left behind, the sorrow and the pain in their faces, and people will see all kinds of things. But recently, I found a video, and so far we don't know who uploaded the video, because everyone is just like, we don't know who uploaded it, but it's just been circulating online. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting, because you know what the Lord said to us? I think it was on, when was the last time I was here? Saturday? On Saturday, we read a scripture talking about the fact that the angels themselves will herald the coming of the Lord. When Jesus came the first time, it wasn't people that were going around. The wise men only spoke about it because as kings, they needed to pay homage to another king. And that was why they stopped at Herod's place. Other than that, there was, no, there was really no record of people talking about what just happened, apart from the shepherds who shared a testimony of what they had experienced. The true revelation of what was going on came from the angels because the Bible says the angels were singing joy to the world. The Lord is come. I'm not saying that so that we can sit at home and not preach the gospel. But I am saying what I am saying so that you can know that the things that we need to say are the things that the angels are saying. Let me break that down a little bit. You know, we've been talking about the ministry of angels, how we're going to experience more the ministry of angels and how we need to pay attention. And one of the things that's come to my attention is some of us are not preaching because of the fact that we don't feel effective in what we're saying. We are repeating and regurgitating a lot of what others said to us. But regurgitating and repeating the things that we have heard will not carry as much power in these last days as if we hear what the angels themselves are saying. You know that at the time that this, at, at the time that Jesus was born, the nation of Israel was in torment. They were being mistreated by the government of the day. A census was called that was quite unexpected. And the people were like, why? And that was because they wanted to tax them even more. But you can't tax a people whose numbers you do not know. And so they knew the census was not because the government wanted to make more roads and give them more privileges. They knew the census was all about them coming into more trouble. When you look at what's going on, Jesus is definitely around the corner because we are going through a global census. The census program that we have been signed up for is more than social security. Let me tell you something, the world is about to be numbered, pun intended, because remember what number it is that will be called the seal or the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is a census system to know where you are at any point in time and exactly what you're doing. The Bible says without the number, no man will be able to buy or sell. If people somewhere can track your buying and selling, they can track your living. Because many people nowadays cannot live without buying or selling. Even the people who are growing their own food have lost the art of growing food without buying and selling. And what do I mean? Ask anybody growing their own food. They buy the feed for their animals. So if they cannot buy the feed for their animals, their days are numbered. Because before you know what's going on, you've eaten the little animals that you have. And you can't produce more. Because there is no feed. Recently, people were yelling and screaming on social media, saying that their chickens are no longer laying eggs because of the feed that they were giving to them. And I'm like, got you. Because when the Bible says that the Antichrist will be given power to render people inoperative, we will see it happening, happen and it is already happening. So let me tell you something. The time is coming wherein genuinely and truthfully, I mean, let us ask ourselves in here, without divine providence, Without supernatural sustenance, how many of us can last a month without buying and selling? 
Even people here, I'm sure there is somebody in here who still buys water. Oh, actually, we buy water right for the Tuesday meetings. Yeah, so everybody drinks bought water here. That is the reality of it. And so, if buying and selling has become compulsory for everybody, then when the time comes wherein you cannot buy or sell without the mark, have you been counted or have you been counted? They will know the very number, the exact number of people that are on the face of the earth because they wouldn't have to look for you. You would show up and say, here I am, I need some milk. Here I am, give me paper towel. Here I am, count me. Because in the time of Jesus, the Romans didn't have to look for the people. They only gave a command and the people brought themselves to be counted. Pregnant and all, Mary was so pregnant. She was ready to deliver. And Joseph was like, it's either this or death. We have to go. And be counted. And guess what? Everybody was there. That was why there was no room in the inn. Everybody was there. We have come to that same place again. Wherein we have been numbered. The mark of the beast that will be given. Will not be given. So that people can be terminated no it is so that people can be numbered and once people are numbered then guess what happens that is maximum control maximum what control because the moment you know the number of the people that you are to control then it's very difficult for one of them to be missing without you knowing that is exactly what the enemy wants he wants to know the number of us i was on a speaking circuit a couple of years ago when I still spoke at security conferences and I noticed that there was something common to the conferences that I spoke at. Every time they asked me to speak, I was speaking on the same thing. So one day I was like, I need to speak on something different. And then I had a true mental block. I was speaking at about 4 p.m. And by 2 p.m. I still did not know what I was going to speak about. And after a while, I stood up in my hotel room and I said, Lord, what is it? He says, you're resisting. He says, just give in. Say what I want to say. And he said to me, he said, people cannot protect what they do not know. He says, go and tell them that inventory started with me. And I went and spoke at the conference. I stood right there as soon as the Lord spoke to me. And in about 40 minutes, I put together my presentation, the best one I ever gave. Within 40 minutes, put it together. And guess what it was about? It was about Genesis. How everything that God made, he had an inventory of. God maintains an asset register. And without an asset register, there is no dominion because you cannot dominate what you have not identified. And so I went to that conference. Let me tell you something. Right after I spoke, one person came to me. Is the, C, is the CEO of the Americas for a big European company. He came to me and he said to me, he said, when you started from Genesis, I looked around in the room, I recognized that guy is a Jewish guy, that guy is a Muslim, this one is an atheist. He said I was okay because everybody kinds of, in his word, mess, everybody messes with Genesis, with the Old Testament. Excuse my French and his French. And I was like, okay. And he said, he said, but the moment you went to Matthew and you were reading from the Lord's Prayer, he said, I got nervous. I told you the story. He said, and soon after you started, the guy that was wearing the turban, he got up. He said, I was like, yeah, the Muslims are leaving the room. We're going to lose this crowd. He said, but then I remember that that guy was speaking at the next room. So he had to get up. He was like, okay, let's see if anybody else gets up. Nobody else left the room. He said, I don't know how you did it. He says, you captivated this audience and you captivated me too. We need to work together. I walked out of that place with a contract that paid me a full salary for a year just so that I can speak to their team once a month. After a while, I felt bad. So I called them and I said, can I do twice a month instead? And they were like, oh, we don't even have time. The once a month that we come to you is because the boss says we need to come to you. But guess what they were paying me? They paid me a full month salary for a whole year. And I was speaking only once a month. You see, because I obeyed what God was saying. It was the boldest thing that I had ever done, so to speak, to come out in a secular security conference. I knew some of the people in the room. And I knew who they worked for. And they don't like talk like that. You see what I mean? Some of the three-letter agency people were there. 
to the average mind, I would have gone in and said what they wanted to hear. Maybe they would like me and give me jobs. No, but I said what the Lord wanted me to say, which wasn't what they wanted to hear. But let me tell you something. The most senior government contractor in the room came to me. She says, Moses, you took me to church. She said, I haven't been to church since I was about 11 years old. She said, you took me to church today and I want to thank you. You know what happened shortly afterwards through one of their contacts? They put me on TV in Hawaii speaking on security. And I've not, I hadn't even been to Hawaii at the time, but they put me on television there. And that was because the woman recognized that there is value in what this man is saying. Let me tell you something. There is nothing that was made that was made without the word of God. If anything will carry weight, if it's going to have value, if it's going to make impact, it has to be the word of God. Even when Satan went to tempt Jesus, he went with the word of God. So I want to encourage you in the times that we're in, it is not any different, so to speak, from the time Jesus came the first time. The season now is, and he said it, as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. Jesus is the beginning and the end. When he came in the beginning, the angels were the ones who put words in the mouths of people of what they needed to say. The people were in pain. If they were meant to speak on their own, they would not have said joy to the world. They would have said, Lord, help us. They would have said, Lord, deliver us. They would have been asking for God's son when God had already given them a child. You know, the Bible says unto us, a child is born and to us, a son is giving. The people were desperate for the son of sacrifice, but God was at the point of presenting the child that was a gift. The people would not have known in their wildest imagination that they were supposed to be rejoicing because everything around them was that of pain and suffering. Their burdens were just being increased by the system. And I know that what I am saying will resonate in months to come because the lords of the land are getting ready to increase the burden that is on the people. But when that time comes and they are saying, oh, this is horrible. You would not join them in declaring a casting down because you would have heard what the angels are saying and you would say joy to the world. The Lord is come. That is just another reason for y'all because I gave you three reasons the last time of why you need to engage the ministry of angels, right? And so that is another reason so that your words can match what they are saying. Let me tell you something when I believe it was Isaiah when he was prophesying about the gospel. He says the good news will come from the mouth of the man in linen, in white linen. That which is called the true good news. And in Acts chapter 1 when Jesus was taken up on the Mount of Ascension, what did he say? He said to them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. But did he tell them what the gospel was? He just told them, go preach the gospel. It was the angels who were there dressed in white linen, just as the man of God had prophesied, who said to them what the gospel should be. They said, as you see him taken up, so shall you see him return. Isn't that the gospel? Because if he is not returning to us, that is, there is no gospel. Paul says, if we have already received all of what he paid for in Ephesians chapter 4, he says, then why do we need hope? He says, we have hope because we have not fully received that which he paid for. The gospel is not that you would die and go to heaven because that is actually not in the word of God. The people who sold us on the idea of saying, oh, the gospel is give your life to Christ and then you die and go to heaven. They kept telling us that because of the fact that they will, they are not work because they're still operating. They tell us things like that because Satan wants to inherit the earth. So the people that the earth truly belongs to, he wants to get rid of them. He wants them to believe in the lie so that they can be grasping onto nothing. I can't say this enough, folks, but we need to renounce 
Every confession about dying and going to heaven and be there forever because the word of God says that it is the will of God that he, God, will come and dwell amongst men and be here with us until the new Jerusalem comes and then we all move to the new Jerusalem and be there forever and ever. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 verse 5, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. We are not going anywhere. We are going to be caught up in a moment so that we are changed and we will return with him to reign with him in righteousness. We are approaching the dispensation of the thrones. And that is the reason why he calls us kings and priests unto our God. We will sit upon thrones upon this earth and restore this fallen realm to what it should be. So what is the real good news then if you would ask me? Jesus said it himself. He says, I am coming speedily and my reward is with me. That is the good news. The good news is that having believed in him and having become a new creation in him, I can have an opportunity to do the works of him who has sent me so that when he shows up, he will call me a good and faithful servant. He will call me Onesiphorus because I will be a profitable one. It is not just enough to live and die and go to some imaginary place. It is all about living here as Christ himself lived. He said, as I am, so are you in this world and it's not too late for us to wake up and begin to do the works so that when he comes there will be something to reward this is the reason why when I heard this gentleman's testimony of what he saw he said this was I, I, we will find the video and share it in the group this young man is prob probably about 15 or 16 years old his mom got out of the camera and said tell everybody the dream that you told me and he started out by saying, he said, I saw myself not in a dream. He said, it was like I was physically present and my brother was with me. He said, and suddenly looking up, I noticed the sun and he said, the sky was torn open like a veil. Just as the Bible says, I believe in Revelation chapter 6 verse 14, the Bible says that the heavens will be opened up. The Lord Jesus is coming with so much zest to receive us that he will not come in through the windows of the heavens no because he says the one that comes in through the window is a thief but I am the door he will make an opening for himself in the cloud he said I saw the skies being torn open and the sun rolled backwards with it he said the moment that happened I looked at the one who was next to me and he said he became particles of light he became like a billion stars he said, I could still tell that was him. That was his younger brother. His a brother, he didn't say younger or older, he just said his brother. He said, I could still tell his form. He said, but he had become particles of light. He said, you know, the way I can describe that thing is like in the Avengers. That was in his words. When those people became particles of, of dirt, of darkness. His brother became the particles of light. When I heard that, I'm like, I said to myself, flesh and blood have not revealed this to this man except my father in heaven. You know why? When Daniel saw the rapture, that was what he saw. And you know what this young man said? He said, a voice stood before him and said, the reason why you are not changed like your brother is because you took all of what I gave you for yourself. He said, and in an instant, he said there was a grid of scenarios that appeared in front of him. And when he said that, I, did, I haven't told my wife yet, but... I could relate with that because I've seen the same kind of image before. There is a way God shows things to people that is actually quite consistent from person to person. And one of such things is God would allow you to see a grid of multiple screens. Each one of them may look this tiny, but to you in that moment, it's like you can see yourself back in those scenarios. He said, I saw a grid of several scenarios. He said, one of them was with me at work, looking at my face in the mirror and just feeling good about myself. Another one was me just reading the Bible and getting excited about revelations, about the revelations and insight that he was receiving. He said he saw himself, but everything was about him. He said, and the voice said to him, you took it all for yourself. You did not share with another. The reason why he wasn't transformed according to the warning vision that he saw was because he did not win souls. Manuelita just left the room. It's okay. We'll keep preaching. 
She's <laughs> come on now, I like that. <laughs> All righty, you need to you need to bless Brother Matthew afterwards. What a great um, bailout for you there. Now let's read Daniel chapter twelve, and let me show you what I believe this man saw. Now let me say this. You know, I told you that we're going to talk about forgiveness. Forgiveness begins with you. Okay? So don't be feeling bad that you have not been winning souls. If you have not been winning souls. Because that's what the devil wants. He wants you to feel guilty. And guilt is an inhibitor. Right? I was sharing with the men earlier today. You know, the Bible says we have seven heavens. And each of the heavens represents each of the spirits of God. And there are seven spirits of God. And we know that the very first one at the very top of the chain is wisdom. Because wisdom in Proverbs chapter 8 is said to, where is she said to Solomon that I am wisdom and the Almighty possessed me right from the beginning of his ways, even before the primal dust of the earth was made. He said before the Almighty God drew a circle upon the face of the deep, he possessed I, wisdom. So wisdom is the very top most heaven. And after wisdom, the next level is what? Understanding. After understanding is knowledge. After knowledge is might. You know, the spirit of might is the spirit of ability. In order for us to do anything in righteousness, we have to be free from the burden of guilt. While we're still guilty, whatever we're doing is not recognized. Because guilt has a stench, but righteousness has a fragrance. So don't let the devil make you feel guilty. Whenever you receive a warning or a call out just like this, let it be an exciting time to say, yes, the Lord knew exactly where I was and is calling me out to go out. You understand what I mean? Because in the past, the devil has used the trick on us several times. People have been going to church for 37 years and 37 years and they are still addicted to alcohol simply because every time somebody talks about drinking from the pulpit rather than receiving liberation they receive what condemnation there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus Romans chapter 8 verse 1 who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit why for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death embrace the forgiveness that Jesus so dearly pays for so that you can be useful to yourself and to God's kingdom so don't be there feeling like oh my god all these years I've not no he's preparing you but now it's time for you to go out and do something when this guy saw that he was not transformed, he was concerned. And the voice came and told him what was going on. I believe it's not because Jesus wants to leave that young man behind when he comes. It's because he wants him to see that there was a need for a change. And he elevated his brother in front of him as an example of a believer. An example to him as a believer. Now let's look at Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, what does it say? I think I used most of my voice while I was while we were in worship today. So if it sounds like I'm straining, uh, please bear with me. It's a sacrifice. In fact, I love reading this Daniel chapter 12. So we're just going to start from verse 1. And I know you love it too. It's an awesome chapter, isn't it? So amazing. Daniel chapter 12, we're going to read from verse 1. And what does it say? At that time, Oh, Rabakams kum tayele kum gabom zayala kum gusheta yevabambi asumteya. So one of the things that just got brought to my attention lately, I, I didn't share this. I wasn't sure if I shared it or not. So I asked Alan, I said, did I share this? He said, ah, no. So I'm going to share it with you real quick because you guys were here when the angel of the Lord showed it to me. I saw a cloud over this place. Not, that because, not like it's here, but it was kind of displayed around here. And there was an angel of the Lord that was on it and it was an archer. An archer is someone with a bow and arrow. And this angel of the Lord was floating upon the clouds. So let me tell you this. I just learned this very, very recently, maybe about a couple of weeks ago. The angels of the clouds are the angels of the second coming. Because it's been prophesied that when Jesus comes, he will ride the clouds as his chariot. You understand what I mean? And the word 20,000 chariots, you know, I told you that the word 20,000 is the Hebrew word for a myriad. So in Hebrews, if you want to say something, there's a myriad of people, you will say there, there are 20,000 people. So we're not expecting a handful of angels. 20,000 is nothing. If you know how prepared the enemy is, then you know 20,000 is nothing. 
right? So we know that that 20,000 refers to a myriad of clouds and those clouds are already beginning to appear. It's just that so far men don't see the angels, they only see the clouds. Remember the cloud that came over France? What happened shortly afterward? The stars of heaven fell to the ground, right? The ones that appeared over um, Turkey resulted into the earthquakes. You see, so all of these things are the signs of Joel chapter 2 verse 30 that I shared with you that the Bible says we're going to see that God himself will put out signs in the heavens. Do you know that is interesting because God said in Joel chapter 2 that he will put signs in the heavens of the fire, of the cloud, and of the pillars of smoke. But he also said when Jesus was speaking that there will be false signs in the heavens. Satan will do his own too. Satan is beaming out false things here and there. For example, People will tell you that, oh, we shut down some kind of alien craft. But the Bible tells us that when the real soldiers come in Joel chapter 2, that none of, their, none of our weapons will be effective against them. So let us be willing to sift through the truth and the lie so that we are not bamboozled or confused. All right? So I just say that because it may not have been very clear from the last time. Now, this archer of an angel was targeting things on the ground and was firing at those things. And as he was firing at those things, some of them were getting buried under his arrow while some of them were lighting up in flames. The pillars of smoke have already begun. If you have been paying attention, not to the fake news media, but if you've been paying attention to the news that is being reported by the messengers, what did I tell you on Saturday? The real thing going on in the world is in the mouth of the angels. And some of these angels are on social media because they know that that is where you're at. The Bible says they will go and they will be seen upon the mountains. The mountains proverbially represent places that are noticeable. Jesus says you are like lights that are set upon a hill. If someone goes to sit on the mountain in Stone Mountain, can Josephine see them from where she's at now? No, but the new mountains are what? Social media. Remember in the year 2020 when the lockdown was on, the Lord took me and he sat me down and he showed me where Megiddo is because the battle is happening where? In Megiddo. And that is why it's called the battle of Armageddon. Because Megiddo comes from Megiddo. And he said to me, this is Megiddo. The real Megiddo was formed by the passage of several people to do business. And it became a tell. A tell is a hill or a mound that forms through the networking of people as they cross paths. That is what forms a tell. So the real Megiddo that the men of God saw, the physical Megiddo, was formed by the connections of people. And he said to me, where is Megiddo today? I said, Lord, you know. And he told me the internet is the new Megiddo. He said, because that internet is formed by a mesh of the connection of people for business. The internet was intended for commerce. But as you can see now, it's become this huge mound. And so when the angels of the Lord are going to be on the mountains, they will be on social media. I have told you this for two plus years. It was... Shortly before the lockdown, I think it was, one day I was watching YouTube and it just occurred to me that, wait a minute, which kind of algorithm connected this video to that video to that video? How come I saw all of them? And the Lord said to me, you have not seen men, but you have seen angels. So God has sent out his angels to speak so that you and I are without excuse. The shepherds were not prophets. The shepherds, there was no record of them having prayed and fasted. They were not in the temple. They were out on the field minding their business and the angels reached them there. So no one will have an excuse because the angels are online preaching the gospel. You are supposed to be witnesses too. You know what I'm saying? Let me clarify we're not supposed to sit on our hands and say, well, let the angels do the witnessing. No. Jesus says, you shall be my witnesses. The angels are just there to give you what to say. Just as they did when Jesus came. 
Do you understand what I mean? And so this angel that was riding upon the clouds, that was shooting things down in the vision that I saw, some of those things were going down and some of them were erupting. Where have we seen eruptions lately? On social media. The news is not reporting on all the explosions that are going on. Is the, can you see them in the news? I don't watch the news, but what I've been told is that people don't see them in the news, but they are on social media because the angels are exposing that so that you know part of the signs of his coming. Is it making sense? So that you know what? The signs of his coming. This is not an invitation to go and sit on social media for the purpose of being entertained. No, because the ones who seek entertainment will find it and be drunk into stupor. That was why Jesus says, do not be drunk with the wine of their carousement. But we still have to go where the message is being given. Oh, Jesus warned us. I mean, he told us. What did he say? He says, the kingdom of heaven is like children playing in the marketplaces. He says, we have sung for you and we have danced for you, but you missed our signal. That was what Jesus said. And so when you watch people on social media and they're singing and dancing, don't miss the signal. Know what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. Go to the highways, he says, and the byways. What is the latest highway? The biggest highway in the world is called what? The super highway, a.k.a. internet. You understand what I mean? God was the mastermind of all of these things. Some people are like, yeah, but the Romans built the internet. Yeah, but they were the ones who built the roads that the missionaries traveled on. They were the ones who built the roads that the, the, the apostles traveled on. God will use anybody to achieve his aim. So don't you be there judging and condemning anyone. Remember, one of the biggest warnings of this time is this. Do not speak evil against dignitaries. Some of the human beings that we're seeing today, today, please, I am begging you. I know some of y'all are tired of hearing me say this. Some of the people in the news on social media, they're not just people. They are angels. I heard the Lord say that to me. He has revealed some of their identities to me. And I am doing you a favor by letting you know, especially the older men, do not speak evil against dignitaries. Some of them are on divine assignments to lie. I'm going to say that again very slowly. Let me show you this verse of scripture. Because we are fond of judging people with our own judgment. Two weeks ago, what did I warn you about? I said, we cannot be part of the Laodiceans. Laodicea means what? The judgment of the people. We have to judge with a righteous judgment because what? We are a Daniel generation. And what Daniel means, God is my judge. If God is your judge, what do you do? You judge like God. Because if you are not judging like your judge, you are in a different court. Does it make sense? Alrighty, let me show you this scripture. I believe it's going to help somebody. Let me find it for you real quick. Alrighty. Don't worry, it will take it might take a little time, but we will find it. Alrighty, come with me to Daniel chapter 4. And we're just going to read a couple of verses here. Praise the Lord. The Lord's been telling me about this for a while. And... If I had acted upon it immediately, I should have this thing on hand. But don't worry, we'll get it. Okay, I believe this is, this is it. One quick second.
All righty. Okay, you know what? I may have to find it for you another time. Um, it is one of those things that nobody talks about, and that's why it's actually a little hard to find. But it is a very hard truth, but it is worthy of saying. And when I find it, I will come and, I will come and share it with you because I know that there are people in this house who need to know this truth. But before then, let me show you something real quick in 2 Samuel chapter 15. Second Samuel chapter 15, and we're going to wrap up by reading this Daniel chapter 12 that I started with earlier. I also believe that I have permission to share with you a dream that my brother had, that my brother had a couple of days ago, and it's about dignitaries. So in the ongoing elections in Nigeria, there's one of the candidates that my brother did not or does not agree with. Let me use the word did not because he had a warning of the Lord. And we had a family meeting and we're just talking our usual family talk. My, all of us were present, my parents, my siblings. And while we were talking, my sister mentioned this particular political, political figure. And my brother was like, we don't, we don't use that name here. We don't, that guy is not even welcome in our conversation. And my sister was like, oh, what do you mean? This and that. And the guy was like, no, for this reason and for that reason. And my brother was about getting angry. The fact that my sister was even considering the possibility that there is a good, there is any good in that guy. You know, there are certain times that you conclude that certain people based on their track record and what you have seen that they cannot be good. But I came as the peacemaker. I tried to change the subject the first time. It wasn't working. Second time it wasn't working. I just told them straight up, we cannot really say things we don't know. Can we just, and I know that we are not supposed to speak evil about dignitaries. And so I insisted on calling it quits on that conversation. Let's move on to something else. Do you know that that night the Lord visited my brother? I won't tell you which one it is so that when you see him, you don't say, ha, 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 ha. And one of the, and what he saw in the dream was the same political, political figure that he was casting down. He saw the man elevated in his dream. And in his dream, in his spirit state without guile, he was instructed to go and salute this person. He said, I could not believe myself. I saw myself go to him and I said, well done. You are doing well. Thank you, sir. He said, I even called him father. I was, I laughed so much that he was like, really? You will do that to me? I said, I wasn't the one who gave you the dream. He was the Lord. I said, because he was less than 24 hours. We spoke about him in the afternoon and he went to bed. Afternoon, my time, evening, his time, he went to bed. He said not once, not twice, but three times the Lord made him go to salute this fellow. How many times did that try to change the subject? Three times. And he denied the fellow three times, just like Peter denied Jesus three times. But when Jesus was raised up, Jesus made Peter confess him three times. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And the third time, Peter was like, Lord, you know that I love you. He said the third time that he went to meet the man, he even said to him, well done, Father. I said, let me tell you what just happened. Because I take joy in spelling it out. Because I know you already know. I said, when people are here on assignment by God, they don't have to look like it. And that was why they warned us. Jude was the one who told us some of the clearest messages about the second coming of Jesus. He said what Enoch said, that the Lord will come with a myriad of his angels. He said that. He also said that the angels who came ahead of us, the fallen angels who took wives of the, of the sons of men, he told us how the punishment is going to go. This guy was very connected. And one of the things that he told us, do you know that there was really nobody else who had in the New Testament that we have a revelation of what happened to the body of Moses, but Jude? Jude said when Michael, Archangel Michael was the one who drove Satan out of heaven. When he came to retrieve the body of Moses on the Mount of Nebo, where, where God hid him, do you think he would have anticipated that Satan, the same Satan that he kicked out, would contest for the body? But Jude said, Satan went to Michael and says, you can't have that body, it's in my territory. And if that was me, if I once kicked Satan out of heaven and he started to stop me from retrieving the body of Moses, how would I say to him, dude, get lost. 
But the Bible says, Jude speaking, he says, even the archangel Michael did not revile Satan, for we are not to revile dignitaries. He said, he only said to him, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. The reason why I'm saying these things is because Satan knows how emotional and sentimental we have become. And he sets traps for us everywhere so that we can speak out of the flesh rather than speak according to the spirit. You will see people behave badly because Satan sent them so that you can judge them with an unrighteous judgment. And all the Lord may want you to say to them is, can you do that dance again one more time? Awesome. And be on your way. Because the Bible says, be kind to strangers. For by so doing, others have unwittingly, many rather, have unwittingly entertained angels. Who is a stranger? A stranger is someone who is doing strange things. They're not from where you're from. They're not from your political system. They're not from your social structure mindset. They are doing strange things. The Bible says be kind to them because some of them are angels in disguise. Because when God says Jesus will not come until the cup of wickedness is full. You think God is going to leave that just to human beings to fill up? There are angels amongst us who are doing things that we don't approve of. But it is a test to see whether we will do the things that God has approved of. Will you love or will you judge? We believe that some people are not worthy of our forgiveness. And that is a trap that has been set to know whether you, even you, know the value of God's forgiveness. Remember the parable that Jesus told? Jesus told the parable of a man who was forgiven about maybe 10, 10 units of money. I mean, 100 units of money. But the guy who was owing him just 10 units, after they forgave him 100, he went to that guy and the Bible says he held him by the neck and threatened that he was going to kill him if he didn't pay up. And the master heard of it and says, Let, go and send, send for this young man. Did I not forgive you 100 and told you to go scot-free? But the one owing you 10, now you want to kill him. He says, you know what? That which I forgave you of has not been reversed. Now you owe me and you don't even have the grace to pay back. Let him be cast into the dungeons. You see, if you know the value of the forgiveness, God forgave you of more than anybody could do to you. Because the evil that men do to you is actually not evil when you think about it. It's an opportunity for your light to shine. It is an opportunity for God to receive glory. And so when people are hurting you, God already set into motion that even if they mean it for evil, God will turn it around for good. So can somebody truly do you evil? So basically, when you think somebody is unforgivable, it is a trap. God does not want you to fall into that trap. No one is unforgivable from your standpoint because you have been forgiven. You understand what I mean? And so what do we do? We need to learn that we need to forgive people. And what is the most mature degree of forgiveness? You've heard me teach this before, Tia, haven't you? That forgiveness begins from level one. Level one of forgiveness. Jesus said, if somebody offends you and they come back to you to ask for forgiveness, even if it is 70 times seven, you have to keep forgiving them. He also said, if they don't ask you for forgiveness, forgive them anyway. That is level two. And what is level three? Level three is that there is even nothing to forgive because you do not take offense. Jesus says, blessed is he who is not offended for my sake. That is the level of forgiveness that we need to operate on because of the fact that if you don't, you're jeopardizing your own salvation. And at a minimum, God wants you to save your soul. At a minimum. At a minimum, you cannot lose your own salvation. That was what Paul said. He says, I put my body under because after having turned others to Christ, I don't want to be a cast away. You understand what I mean? So don't jeopardize your forgiveness by holding somebody else in unforgiveness. Second Samuel chapter 15. All righty. Okay, so let's do this. Um... I just got to, okay, I'm out of time. So what we'll, what we'll do is we might come back to this one maybe on Tuesday. So remind me on Tuesday that I want to show you a clear description 
of some of heaven's agents that are on the earth that look like baddies. They look like terrible people, but we know who they're really working for. And because of who they're working for, you cannot mess with them. Okay, they may not look friendly, they may not look nice, they may not even look righteous, but please, by the time we go through those attributes, because there are about maybe four critical things that you need to learn how to look for. And if you can find those four things in every situation, that will give you a more, gives, give you, that gives you more of an equipping when it comes to testing spirits. So, because time is up, we're not going to get into that. I'm going to package it by the grace of God. What I mean by package is get the scriptures out so we can just read through them and extract the attributes. Let's land this plane by going back to Daniel chapter 12, which we started from. Daniel chapter 12, so that I can tell you a conclusion to the young man's testimony. And the reason why I approve of that testimony as the true description of what to anticipate on the great day of the Lord. So we've talked about Revelation 6.14, the heavens opening up and the, the stars, including the sun, being rolled away. Now look at what it says in Daniel chapter 12. Um, let us read verse 1. Actually, let's read from verse 1. It says, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was seen, seen since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book, everyone whose name is on God's register. And this was even before Jesus came. This was before the book of life was introduced to us in the New Testament. There's always been a book. Moses was given an opportunity also in Exodus to see the book of life where God writes the name of everything that will be introduced into this world on his account. Alrighty. And so when Jesus comes back, he's coming for the people whose names are originally on the register, not the tears that were sown by the devil. I say that because there are people here on earth, they look like you and I, but they do not have their names in God's book because they were put here by Satan. Alrighty, and you know I've taught extensively on that, so um, if, you, if you need help, you can do a search on YouTube for one of those teachings, you will find it. And if you can't find it, ask Manna Lita. She watches those things a lot. Um, so let's go back to verse two. He says, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake which means the dead in Christ shall rise first. So you see these things have been prophesied in different places so that we don't get confused. Now, verse 3 says, actually verse 2 says, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. May we not be resurrected unto shame. That was what God showed that young man so that he can receive instruction. Not so that he can feel guilty. Because when you're guilty, you don't move. But when you are rebuked in righteousness, what do you do? You are convicted unto righteousness. The Bible says the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin and the believer of righteousness. So if the Holy Spirit is convicting you and you're not attaining righteousness for divine action, that means there is worldliness in you. So divorce yourself from the world and embrace the conviction of righteousness. Does that make sense? So verse 3 says, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. What is the brightness of the firmament? The stars. So the ones who are wise, when the Lord tears open the clouds, the reason why Michael's name is here is because in Revelations, we are told that the Lord will speak with the voice of an archangel. I think I've explained to you the reason why some people think Jesus might be Michael and Michael is Jesus. No, Jesus is the only begotten son of God. He only spoke with the voice of Michael, the archangel. So whatever Michael was saying here, Jesus was saying it. He was just using his voice. Does it make sense? Alrighty. So what does he say else? He says, and those who turn many to righteousness will be like stars forever and ever. Let me explain something to you. The word forever and ever is the word eternal, which also means without end. So this guy saw his brother become 
multiple stars that cannot be counted. He said his entire being became a cloud of stars. And what did Jesus say to this young man in the dream, in the vision that he saw? He said, your brother was transfigured because he turned many to righteousness. Don't let anybody shut you up. You don't have to preach a long sermon like me. In fact, I don't even recommend it. Oh yes, I don't recommend it. Because even myself, my wife has videos of me falling asleep to my own teaching. Because sometimes I'm trying to watch it and I fall asleep. She has like a catalog of videos. And she would say to me, you see yourself? Nobody preaches for two hours. Even you cannot listen to yourself for two hours. So I don't recommend it. I'm, I'm working on it. Come on, praise God. Yeah, I'm hoping today is only about an hour and 30 minutes. So maybe the next time it's going to be an hour and 29 and a half minutes. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. But what I am saying is, you don't have to preach a long sermon, but you just have to speak what the angels are saying. Because you're tired of saying what you've been saying because nobody's changing. You understand what I mean? The frustration is that we're trying to preach and they don't recognize what you're saying as the gospel because you're regurgitating what somebody said. Hear what the angels of the Lord are saying unto the churches. And when you hear that, when you say it, the ones who are still in the world, who are meant to be of the ecclesia, they will wake up and come to you. The Lord has made our work very easy. So if you want to know how to engage the ministry of angels, listen to last week's message and also listen to the Q&A, the Moses and Rosemary Q&A that we do on Fridays. Did I not talk about that again on Fridays? On Friday, on Friday, I went into another dimension of hearing from the Lord through the ministry of angels, right? And Fridays is only one hour. So you're, you, you're good. It's, not a, you, it's easy to find what you're looking for and also, I speak a lot slower and I break things down a lot more. Do, we have a, do I have a witness? Yeah, that was after months of grilling me. My wife is always like, nobody understood. So you will answer that question again next Friday. <laughs> you all have seen her do that to me, right? She will say, well, you attempted to answer this question last week, but nobody got it. Answer it again. It's okay. We're all work in progress. We will get there eventually. I believe that before Jesus comes, the time is coming when I might even preach for 30 minutes. And then make it up the next service by preaching for six hours. Because what has to be said has to be said. Left to Matthew, every sermon here will be like three hours. <coughs> and end too. Oh man, a leader will be all night every time. And brother Greg is going to be like a whole weekend. Yeah, because he never said to me that, oh, I took time. He's always like, oh, I wish you were just, that you would just keep going. I'm like, Brother Greg, only you wish that I would keep going after two hours. Maybe you and Brother Matthew. God is good. So I'm going to leave you with one scripture today. It's the book of John, chapter 1, verse 1. This is a scripture that recently I saw it. You know, when you see the word of God, he jumps out and it's like life. That is the expectation Jesus wants you to have of the word of God. Jesus says the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Look at what he says, John chapter 1 verse 1. I can quote it by heart and I'm sure you can too, but let us read it. The Bible says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. In the beginning was the word. The Lord said to me that we need to recognize when his angels are speaking because the beginning of their message will be the word of God. The beginning of every thought that is inspired in your heart has to be the word of God. If any thought or notion is inspired within you and it's not the word of God, shut it down very quickly. And until you find the word of God becoming the beginning of your speech, do not speak. I am begging you in the name of God. We have shut too many people out of the kingdom. And we need to undo what we have done by the grace of God. A lot of people don't want to come close to Jesus because of what you have said. And that is the reason why we now need to say what the angels say. Because every one of them is a messenger. And the messenger has no message of his own except that which the Father has sent. You know when the Lord said to Moses that my angel is going before you. What did he say? He said I have given him my name. 
And so when Jesus introduced the Holy Spirit to the disciples, what did he say to them? He said, he will not speak anything of his own except that which the Father is saying. You can rely on the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the ministry of angels because they are speaking the mind of the Father. And the Father's mind is what the unbeliever wants to hear because that is what contains pardon for sin. Let us rise. Praise the Lord. Let us just rise quickly and pray in the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, today we have heard not just the voice of a man, but we have heard you speak to our hearts. We are energized and we have the hope of enjoying the ministry of your Holy Spirit and the ministry of the angels who will together inspire within us the words of life that will bring many to righteousness. So when the great day of the Lord comes, we will be transfigured into multiple stars. We will become like the stars of the heaven in radiance as we receive our new bodies with which to set up upon the throne alongside with Jesus to rule and reign upon the earth as we inherit this earth that is our portion in the land of the living. The Lord says, I am your portion and you are my portion. And the Lord says that because he intends to give to us his portion. In Psalms 82, he says, I will come and inherit the earth from the ones who have done badly. And then in Ezekiel, he says, I will give it to my, my children. I will give it to the ones that I have chosen. We are the chosen ones and we anticipate the reward that Jesus is coming with and in that anticipation we work the work of him I want you to declare over yourself that I am his witness <laughs> and I will declare his coming and by so doing many will turn to righteousness I will not lose my reward you know I saw Kayla as I was speaking and what I saw you doing was you were inspecting the door that just got installed. And you were like, okay, this will work. I know what that door is. You know, there are certain times that because of your wiring, you have always given people what they deserve. If they've been silly, they get a good rebuke. If they've been nice, they may get a good compliment. But the Lord has brought you a door now, a door that is installed that allows for you to only send out that which the Lord approves. You see, because some of us, by our makeup, we, we carry natural authority. You understand what I mean? But then also, Jesus said to his disciples, I know you have authority to call down fire from heaven. I gave it to you. He said, but one of the things that I want you to do is, first of all, be reminded of who you are. Because he said to them, if you know who you are and whose you are, at this point, you will not call down fire. I know I've given you the authority. He said, but let there be that check. And the Lord is bringing that to you because he wants to increase your authority. And he doesn't want you to overwhelm the ones that cannot handle it. And so with that door, it's almost like the Lord is introducing like a gatekeeping strategy for you to measure out what goes out of you so that others can be lifted to the measure of their equipping. You see what I mean? Because there are times we're in out of the goodness of our hearts. We want to rebuke people, want to tell them what we believe they need to know, but then that scares them away or that overwhelms them. So the Lord is bringing to you, I see it. It is an operation of the understanding of the grace of God that would allow for you to meet people where they're at. And you just be amazed. I thought, well, okay, uh, that, that's all. And the Lord will say, that's all. That's all you need to say to that person. And when you see the outcome of that one word that you said to them, and some of them, you just have to open the door for them to see your face. You don't even have to say anything. Just your face alone will deliver the transformation that is needed. So behind this door will come the grace of God through your obedience and faithfulness in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. God is good. Let's be seated one more minute. Hallelujah. Oh, there's one more prayer that we have to say. You see, because before the radiance comes, hmm, let me show you something that Daniel said here in Daniel chapter 7. <laughs> because we will turn many to righteousness, but there is a prayer here. Hmm. In Daniel chapter 7 verse 19, he says, Then I wished to know the truth about the fourth beast. Please, I want you to pay attention. I told you about the beasts. What did I tell you the last time I was talking about the four beasts? When I was talking about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, I told you that the fourth beast 
had just been spoken about when the earthquakes began. Right? And who or what was the fourth beast? You know, the beast number one was the one that was sitting upon the white horse that was given a crown to conquer and to conquer. And I told you by revelation, the Holy Spirit let me know that the fourth, the very first beast was the one that was in operation when COVID broke out. And that was why it was called Corona because Corona means the crown because he was the horse that was sitting and was given a crown to conquer and to conquer. Conquer and to conquer. That repetition was there to emphasize the range of his coverage. And there's never been any authority that covered the whole earth as the authority of the white horse. And that was why the lockdown was everywhere, for the most part, almost everywhere. And so after that was what? The red horse. And the red horse brought conflict upon the earth, setting people against one another. We saw a level of that on the internet, everybody finding one another. But then when January 21, I mean, when Jan January 22 came, after we had seen the beast that was presented to the United Nations in, in November or so of 2021, we knew that nations would rise against nations. And that was when the Volodymyrs, the lords, came against each other, right? Bringing behind them other kings. So don't be, don't be deceived. It's not just Russia and Ukraine. Russia represents a set of kings. Ukraine represents another set of kings because their names tell us that. Vladimir is the same name as Volodymyr, just in different dialects, and it means ruler of the world. So the people that are ruling are fighting against one another. So we've seen another dimension of the red horse. And then the black horse was the one that was given a pair of scales. And those scales represent the ability to maintain balance even when there is no balance. Because his operation was to bring inflation upon the earth that is going to result into famine. And we're beginning to see anywhere you go in the world, inflation is at an all-time high. People are firing their treasury officers, their ministers of finance because everyone is confused. They don't know what's going on. England elected the best finance people they had and they fired them within just a couple of days. From the prime minister that was hired, she was a fantastic finance mind. She got fired. The shortest prime minister in history. And then they brought in another lady. Boom, the same thing. And so what do we know? One of the things that we know is that the black horse is in operation and people don't even know what to do. People are changing their currency, wondering if that will fix the problem, but it isn't. Because the black horse has the power over the scales to tilt it wherever it wants. And so we've seen those things and the Bible lets us know that those three are not all, that the fourth beast will come and that is the beast that brings death. The Bible says it will ride and Hades will come behind him. Hell itself will move its boundaries behind the fourth horse because there will be just too many people. So death does not want to be sending people to hell. Hell doesn't want to have to. So they're going to move together because of the volume of clients that they will receive. Lord, help us. But this is what Daniel is saying. You need to pray like Daniel prayed. He says, I wish to know more about the fourth beast. Let me tell you something. We need to know about this fourth beast. Because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Why do we need to know? The Lord revealed to me that we need to know the scroll of the assignment of the fourth beast. That we may say that which that beast says. Because it's part of our message. It is what some people will hear that will awaken them from sleep. We all have family members in our extended family who are still asleep. Who are still drunk with the wine of carousing who don't know what is really going on in the world. They are giving everything to saving their political party, giving everything to save their career, giving everything to save their holidays. They just want everything to go back to normal so they can go on a cruise. And you're like, what normal are you talking about? We want everything to happen the way prophecy says so that Jesus can come. You know, I am being mindful of time, but I am also... Even more so, I should say, be mindful of the Holy Ghost. He said to me, he says, we cannot just end the prayer at saying that we want to turn many to righteousness when we don't have the equipping. He says the equipping is when you know the message of the fourth beast. Daniel 7, he says that I, I wish to know. You see, the Lord said to me, he reminded me this week, this last week, I keep hearing it. He knows who follows to know. And I didn't think too much about it. I meditated upon it quite all right. But when I came in here today, 
The reason why my voice is like this was while worship was going on. I saw myself begging and pleading for the rain, begging and pleading for the door, begging and pleading for a visitation. Because you know why? That was what I was asking for. I didn't even know the song that the choir was going to sing. But that was literally what I was asking for all week. But the Lord showed to me that the way I was asking for it is not the way to receive it. He showed me how to ask for it. He says, this is the time for you to let me know that you want it. You saw the way that I was on my knees, begging, begging and asking for it. And when the, when the band started to sing that song, it was like, oh my goodness, you all set me on fire here. Simply because if you don't put out everything that is on the inside of you, do you know why God wants you to sometimes beg and plead and scream for things? You know why? Because he needs for you to empty out so that you can make room for what is coming in. If the Lord just gives it to you the moment he asks for it, you will have but this much room to receive it because you have not traveled. The water is not broken just yet. You want the baby to come, the water needs to break first. Something needs to come out of you. The tears, the snort. You need to beg the Lord for power. Because the Bible says it only comes by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. What is supplication? Supplication means a humble plea. That means you reduce yourself to the lowest that you can be, whether on your face, on your knees, but reduce yourself, take the posture. I will tell you this and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna shush so that y'all can go home. In the early hours of this morning, I wanted to pray because the Holy Spirit told me that I needed to pray about certain things. I was thinking about certain things and it woke me up. And the Holy Spirit says, you know you woke up because you're thinking seriously about these things. I said, yes, I am because I wanna see traction. Because there are certain things that have become almost like at a standstill in business. And I'm like, no, God, these things need to have come. Come on, Lord. You know? And then I was thinking, then I woke up. And when I woke up, the Holy Spirit said to me, you're still doing the same thing. You're thinking. Pray. And immediately, the angel of the Lord who was assigned to me says, you know what you must do now. You need to kneel. And I was like, no, no, this is me doing too much. I don't need to kneel. My Heavenly Father knows that which I have need for even before I ask. And I was still laying there. And I heard that voice again kneel. And the moment I knelt down, it was almost as if the father was sitting there waiting for me. As soon as I knelt down, I heard his voice very audibly. Sometimes your posture has to also reflect your heart. How bad do you want it? Josephine, how bad do you want it? It has to be in your posture. Kneel if you can. Lay on your face if you can. But whatever you do, you need to be emptying out everything that you can to make room. It's not that God is mean. He knows what you have need of even before you ask. He wants to give it to you more than you want to receive it because it's for his glory ultimately. You understand what I mean? So, but guess what? You still need to fulfill the requirements. So be ready to ask him for the power. Because when you ask him the right way, the Bible says Jesus speaking. You know what he says, Kayla? He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And it's like, okay, so you're not going to fill me if I am just desiring it, desire, if I'm just being desirous of it. He says, that's when we bring you in line. But if other people are being served before you in line, it is now up to you to fast track yourself by developing the hunger and the thirst for it. So I don't want you to just see what this man is saying as, oh, I wish. No, I will plead with the Lord. I will seek the Lord that I may know the truth about the fourth beast. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord says to me that as many as ask me diligently, I will show to them the scroll of the fourth beast. And their mouths will be equipped to speak of the love of God. You will speak of the love of your heavenly father. And many will turn to righteousness on your account. I seal your heart and this message in the blood of Jesus. So that no birds of the air will be able to locate this instruction to rub you of it. But it will mature in you. And it will produce for you the hunger and the thirst for the righteousness. Be activated in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord.
Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the man of God one more time as the Lord has ministered to him, through him greatly tonight. If I, my sister will help us with the offering slide, we'll go ahead and worship God in our giving. What a night. This, this wasn't a night to miss. I'm here to tell you. No, nah, no, nah, this wasn't one you wanted to miss. Praise God. So I given details on the screen. I'm not going to hold this. What the Lord has placed on your heart to give, move in there. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise for who you are, oh God. <laughs> There's none like you. Lord, we love you. Lord, truly, you have heard our prayers, our petitions, oh God. By your mercy, you have allowed us to encounter you, oh God. You are an all-consuming fire. Father, we thank you for that healing balm that you have sent forth, oozing out in this place, oh God. As many that have received it, oh God, receiving healing by faith, Father, we thank you. We thank you for your ministering spirits, oh God, that have seen about us, that take charge over us by your command. Lord, let these offerings, oh God, be pleasing unto you. For Lord, you have placed it in our hand and we give it back to you. Lord, we thank you that heaven is open over us. Let us take this home. Help us, Holy Spirit, to take this home, oh God, and to just rub in it and to just spend time in your presence, oh God. Not forgetting what you have done, oh Lord, for you bring us into the good land, that land flowing with milk and honey. Father, we thank you for deep calling unto deep as you have ministered through your prophet this evening, oh God. Lord, let us meditate on your word. Lord, what you have given us this night. Lord, we declare that all glory and honor belong to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Hallelujah. Y'all know we'll be back Tuesday, 630. I want everyone to have a safe and blessed weekend. And we'll see y'all then.